You are listening to KDRT LP 95.7 FM, and this is Karen Modokaitis, host of How She Really Does It, where inspiration and possibility meet. I continue my search for answers to improve our lives from people who have spent their lives learning, growing, and understanding. And on How She Really Does It, we bring on guests to the show to really dive into issues to help inform, inspire, and empower you towards a better life. I'd love to hear our listeners' comments about our shows or questions for upcoming guests. You can email me by going to our website, www.howshereallydoesit.com. You can also find our Facebook and Twitter links there and sign up for our newsletter that has special offers just for our subscribers only. Our past shows are available on our website at www.howshereallydoesit.com or as podcasts from iTunes. Martha Beck. She's one of my favorites. And many of you are familiar with Martha from her column on O Magazine or have been touched by one of her many fantastic books, Finding Your Own North Star, Leaving the Saints, Expecting Adam, or Steering by Starlight, just to name a few. Martha has been my teacher and helped me create the life I want, and she is here to discuss with us how you can do that also in your life. Martha, hello and welcome back. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have you. I intend to have fun on this interview with you today. I know. I, I'm kind of wiggling like a puppy. <laughs> That's probably more information than you needed, isn't it? No, it's not. It's just who you are. <laughs> okay. So, so I, this idea of, you know, uh, creating the life that you want, I, I don't believe that I thought that that was possible in my own life. Really? You know, uh, years ago, and doing this radio show has been part of that. Um and so often, and part of this, what ignited the the topic for the show was I was on Facebook and somebody was said that they were starting their job after graduating from college and they should just be thankful that they have a job in this economy. And I thought, Ooh. oh, that feels disempowering. Yeah. And so I wanted to talk to you about creating the life that you want and how that is really possible. Well, first of all, you know, what that guy was saying or that, that child was saying it shows that there is that there's a limitation on possibility right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just saying, I'm lucky to get a job, you know, licking floors with my tongue or whatever. Um, basically, if you don't, if you shoot for the ground, you hit the ground. <laughs> so 
So the first thing is to take off the boundaries. I just, I've been up all night because I just wrote a column for O Magazine that was due this morning, and off it went at 6 in the morning. And uh, that's how I really do it. I don't sleep. <laughs> but and you have no idea how true that is. But the whole point of the column was that we live in this torrent of change and that actually the things you, people used to settle for weren't that possible anymore, like the drudge job that never goes away. Mm-hmm. The, all the drudge jobs are going away. But as the, the, as the technology and the social patterns change in this enormous transformation that we're seeing, there are possibilities for doing things that have never been done before. And you can do them all. By, you can do stuff all by yourself that used to take whole companies full of people to do, using new technologies, creating new ideas. There's never been a time of more possibility than right now. So to say, oh well, I'm lucky to get a crappy little job. Well, you've just built your own prison, and you can walk in and stay there, or you can take the prison walls down by saying anything is possible, and I'm going to have a, a blast out there. And. And, you know, one of the things that people don't see when you talk about those prison walls and those thoughts, I mean, I know this now from training with you and and learning about how critical our thoughts are and what we think. You know, and one of the things that I teach my clients is that are the thoughts that you think can create the prison walls in your life. But I would say not can create. They create (laughs) them all the time. I mean, unless you're actually physically in prison, your only prison is your the prison of your thoughts, truly. Almost anything else is possible, um, but but getting out of the, that first recognition that thoughts are not reality, my thoughts are not necessarily true. If you can get someone to that point, and it's so hard in our culture because we've had it drummed into our heads that we are our thoughts, we are our personalities, what we think is the truth. If you can get rid of that thought and realize that everything is subjective, you're suddenly just sort of in in wild territory. You can do anything, go anywhere, and you'll find that without limiting thoughts, your actions guide themselves into things that are truly amazing and make dreams come true before you even know you had them. Is it is it about figuring out the how or is it about figuring out the what? I think it's 99% the what. And then um, there's doing it, which is 99% perspiration, but um, in terms of inspiring yourself, it's all about visualizing what you want because the thing that you are meant to do probably doesn't exist right now. Everything's changing so fast. And I've had experience with this. When I was, I was trying to get a book published, I had actually had my first book accepted for a huge you know, um, advance of $25,000, woo, which would you know, buy you three Starbucks. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was also, I also just completely lost the question in my sleep-battled mind. Could you please repeat it? Yes. Is it, is it figuring out the what or the how? Ah, yes. Um, yeah, I used to walk around the house writing this book, and I'd think, I just wish that I could write something that was shorter and more, you know, fun-filled, because my book, that first book was not fun-filled. And I wish I could be working with, like, really smart people on a semi-regular basis and seeing my work come out kind of quickly. And it never occurred to me that I could write for magazines because I was living in Arizona, and I thought you had to be, live in New York to write for a magazine. And like three years before that, you did have to live in New York to write a magazine. The first columns that I wrote, I, got, I was wandering around envisioning this life where I got to talk to a few smart, fun people about short pieces of writing that came out frequently. And... I got a chance to write an article for Mademoiselle magazine, which then existed. And I faxed it to them. We didn't have email technology sufficient to send in a whole document even then. Isn't that weird? It was not that long ago. (laughs) And they called me back at like 6 in the morning my time because they, of course, assumed I lived in New York and said, "Uh, how would you like to be a contributing editor and write a column for us? And I literally fell out of bed. I was like, says in a word, yes. And I got up and just sort of wandered around the house going, that's what I was envisioning. I, I had no idea how it could possibly happen, but I guess I must have helped create it because it was precisely what I'd imagined. So imagine what you want to do, what it's going to feel like, 
well, who's going to be around you? And then if you have any really clear ideas about how to make it happen, do them. But don't let go of the joyful vision. That's the most important thing. Well, so often, and I, is this, I'm not sure if this is something we're taught or we learn as we grow up, but it's, you know, there's that clinginess that sometimes happens, right? You send in this article and you go, gosh, what can I do? How can I make this work? And you're constantly pounding away. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound like that's what you did with that, getting that job. I wasn't pounding. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I used to do this thing called, when I was a little kid, I called them having an imagine. <laughs> And I think, this is how I think um, humans do magic. I think that we have to get to the energy state that an animal has where you're completely calm and you, like, are thinking about, about wow, I wish I could find a good dead bird or something. You know, I mean, just sort of, I'm speaking of, of dogs, of course. I don't know about your, your precious bunny rabbit or whatever you have. But um, if you get to that consciousness where you're not really thinking about much, you're just blinking and looking around, and then you imagine something that has not yet happened. See, animals can't do that. They can be in the present, but they can't really imagine what has never been and say, why not? We can be in the present and imagine what has never been. And if we do those two things together in a very light, playful way, stuff tends to happen. But if we sit around thinking and thinking and thinking and powering it with our emotions, oh, my God, I need this, the energy goes all the wrong ways and it will not happen. This is what I have learned. So it's a light thinking of and not a grasping. Light, joyful, playful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, what just happened to me is a great example. You're, you're rattling along and you're talking about something and then you get to a place where you can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ellen DeGeneres says at that point, always just mention Christina Aguilera because the conversation will be fine after that. Um, but, but really the way to recall something, like a word you've forgotten, is to think about it for a while and then go do something else, right? We've all had that mm -hmm. experience. Or is it just me with my aging brain? No, no, we've all had that experience. So it's the push to understand and then the total removal of attention. You remove attention. And that's where people get things wrong. Everybody is like watching their copy of The Secret and you know, imagining up a storm. But the, the magic comes from a place that it has no thought and no emotion. And that's our mistake. We think if we, if we add, take a thought and think it really hard and add a lot of intense emotion, either happy, 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 manic, i got to have that, or angry, this should be mine, or sad, oh, please save me, or afraid, oh, please rescue me. We put all this emotion in it, and we think about it all the time, and that doesn't, that's not useful. It doesn't make it happen. Um, thinking briefly, wow, this would be nice. And then going off and having a latte without a thought in your head, that's what makes magic. Hello? I'm, I'm here. There's a lot of thoughts happening. And so, and again, it's that it's, and I've had this experience happen when I've kind of put some thoughts out there and then I let go. I let go of the outcome. I just, I get really clear on what it is that I want. Right. Get very clear on that. And that there's work in that because sometimes it's, and I know with clients, sometimes my clients have a hard time figuring out what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. But once you get clear with what it is that you want, and then I put it out there. Yep. And, and I had a similar situation where I wanted to be around, I wanted to create envi an environment where I was around more inspirational people, mm -hmm. where people, I just, a community, of, you know. And, and I put down a list of names. And then a few months later, there were the, some of the people that were coming into my life, they were on that list. Cool. You know, and, and it was, but it was, there wasn't an attachment. There wasn't like, oh, they, this must happen this way. I forgot even about the list until a few months after that. Right. And I went and looked at the list. I go, oh my gosh, look at these people that have come in. Mm -hmm. So I did exactly what you talked about. I imagined something. I, I got clear on what it was that I wanted. I imagined it, put, wrote it down, and then I let go of it, and then it happened. Yep. But if I were to figure out, trying to work on figuring out the how I know for me, when I try to figure out the how, I get really stuck. Well, there, there, there is such a thing as an inspired action mm -hmm. when you think, um, like the other day I thought of a really cool TV reality series. And um, I felt like writing up a, uh, something called a one page, which is a proposal, a sort of treatment for a TV show. I wrote it up. I, have nothing, I didn't do anything with it. But I actually felt like it would be really fun to write it up. 
And that's when you do something. It, the the mm-hmm. key word is play. Mm-hmm. The key is fun. It, if something is fun, it has huge energetic power. And we're taught exactly the opposite. We're taught not to have fun. This is school. You know, if you're <laughs> going to make something happen, you've got to be serious. And uh, that is true in the material realm. But in the realm of, of, of magic, of spirituality, ideal, whatever you want to call it, um, it's that gentle, playful, happy way of living that puts us in the power zone. This is Karen Motokaitis of How She Really Does It, and I'm talking with Martha Beck, New York Times bestselling author. Just go to Amazon and put in her name, and you'll see all the wonderful books that she's written. Um, so one of the things that I was getting stuck with was just with my life coaching and you know my practice and my niche and what is my niche, and I would pound away at it because you know that's what I was taught in school. Right. And so finally just let it go, and then... Um, when I was with Bridget, Bridget Brodeau this past weekend, we were talking about it, and my show is about possibilities. I just love when people can see what's possible in their life, and I didn't want to be segmented into just a weight loss coach or a money coach or an entrepreneur coach. I, I like a lot of topics, hence my radio show has a lot of topics. And so, you know, I just we were kind of throwing stuff out there, and she's like, the threads of possibilities and stuff. And then I was talking with somebody else yesterday, and I was like, I just help clients put possibilities into action. And it came like that. Mm-hmm. So it did. It was, it would been kind of stirring around, but the more, the less and less that I said it had to be done a certain way and right. I had to do it, the more and more that I was, it was just kind of fun and I was kind of just going with what I like and the clients that I work with. Right. That's how it came together. And when I did that and the person that I was talking with, they just got chills. Mm-hmm. You know, because. Yeah, I, Susan Hyatt, one of my coaches, calls that the chill of truth. <laughs> 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 I love that. Yeah, you did it perfectly. And you, wait, what's interesting to me is that two things that I wanted to mention. First, you know, in our coaching system, we emphasize mainly how to get rid of thoughts that are causing unhappiness. Mm-hmm. So we really focus. It's not just like we're manifestation coaches and we can make the secret happen for you. It's more we want to eliminate all unnecessary suffering. And 99% of that comes from your mind. Mm -hmm. So learn to not think thoughts that torture you. And what's interesting to me is that's all I ever really do to train myself. I do it every morning. I think of thoughts that, um, you know, I let whatever thought that's troubling me come into consciousness, and then I question it until it lets go of me. And the weird thing is that without any other effort, I find when I do a lot of that, when I keep my mind clear of all thoughts, life becomes truly, bizarrely miraculous. I mean, like, okay, I'll give you a day like day before yesterday. I was I was working in a Starbucks, got up, and just in a great mood thinking about all this stuff. Got up, went to the barista, and I'd never seen the guy before, and he said, I bet you want a pumpkin spice latte with an extra shot. And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I asked for their smallest size, and he gave me a venti, their biggest size. And I said, this is more than I paid for. He said, oh, that's fine. Don't worry about it. And then I went home, and I was, picking up, I was putting up Christmas lights, and I realized I, I had dropped a wreath that I really liked that used to go on the outside of our house. And I, but it didn't bother me. We had other lights. So I was like, wow, I wish I had another wreath. And in a raffle, I won this huge-ass wreath. <laughs> That, I mean, it just came to my house like two minutes later. Um, it, and it, I had like ten um, incidents happen like that in one day just because I was sort of kind of thinking about this topic and really having fun. And you're also, you've practiced this a lot, so you it sounds like you can manifest things much quicker. It's a good thing you mentioned practice because it actually is a skill. Um creating anything in your life, whether it's learning to play the tuba or learning to, like, imagine things and make them come true. It's always a skill, and skill is developed by deep practice, deep practice being a certain kind of practice that is very intense. And there is no such thing as somebody who gets good at anything, including this kind of wah-woo-wah stuff, without deep practice. And deep practice is hard. It is really hard, as we both know. Yeah, you must have done that with your swimming as well as with everything else in your life. Yes, and, and that deep practice and being very conscious and aware and taking it down to, um, I had Daniel Coyle on my show a few months ago, and we talked about it, mm-hmm. you know, and just taking it down and breaking it apart and really mastering it. And that's what I think is one of the factors that 
stops people from creating the life that they want. Tell me where I'm wrong. Oh, you're not wrong at all. I want to hear more from you. <laughs> Say more about that. That people won't deep practice into their lives. Yeah, they won't deep practice. Like they may try something. Like maybe they'll try to manifest something after they hear this interview today, and then they'll go, "Oh, but it didn't work." And then they stop, and they get they because they have the thought that it's not going to work. They practice it. It doesn't work. And then now that's evidence to say, oh, see, what Corinne and Martha were talking about is incorrect because it right. didn't work. And what we, I invite people to do is just to keep practicing it because I know as a swimmer, I know as a swim coach that I didn't become a national champion because the first day I jumped in the pool, I became a national champion because of a 12, you know, it took me 12 years to become a national champion. Which is about typical for becoming a world-class anything. Mm -hmm. It takes 10,000 hours of deep practice to be a world-class master at anything. And um, it, you, that's an hour a day for 10 years, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So think about that. And um, then think, for, for, I was thinking about this the other day. I love practicing the piano because it's a really good way to manifest things because I'm not good at it. Let me explain. I'm really, I have really learned lately that the key to the whole process is dropping it, dropping thoughts dropping thoughts of pain, dropping thoughts of, of fear, dropping every thought. And when I play the piano, because I'm not good at it, I have to pay incredibly co close attention to it, my hands, the, my eyes are what, reading the notes, my ears are listening for it, and my feet are working and all that, and I can't cling to what I want. I'm mm -hmm. really present in the moment. And that, I thought, okay, I'm gonna, if I do this, I'm like as old as the hills. If I do this, for 10 more years, for an hour a day, and really deep practice, I'm going to be a really old pianist, but I'm going to be pretty good. Why not? Why not do it for 10,000 hours? This is so cool. And why not practice manifesting things for 10,000 hours, even though you're not good at it yet? It's, you could be a world master. This is fabulous. And, and, and people, I mean, that's what it, really I want the listeners to get that takeaway today from is that, you know, it's not something that you are the chosen one or the golden child. Everyone can do it. You know, yes, everyone can do it. And I mean, when I coach kids, I have parents that come up to me all the time saying, does my child have talent or does that child have talent? And I, I always look at them. I go, I, I don't know. It's a long journey. They're eight. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. And in some ways, it doesn't even matter if they are that talented right now, because if they don't want it, it's not going to happen. The if the child doesn't want it, they don't have, you know, the second factor in Daniel Coyle's deep, uh, the talent code. It's the, the ignition. If they don't have that ignition, right. it doesn't matter, you know, how coordinated they are in the water. Right. They have to hold that vision. And the vision is the ignition. He talks about, you know, a, a bunch of uh, little Korean girls, see Michelle Wee, um, wailing on that golf ball, and suddenly we have this rash of Korean female golfers because they saw something that, that ignited imagination, and that's the thing. They imagined it. They probably had fun doing it. or deep. One of the things that they mention in all the deep practice stuff is that it's not fun, and it isn't fun in the traditional sense of, like, go to a party and jump around and laugh a lot. But Diane Ackerman has written a book called Deep Play. Have you read this one? No, writing it it's down. The, she, that, she nails it. She nails why people keep practicing for 10,000 grueling hours. Because she talks about the nature of play as this deeply engrossing sacred space where we struggle and we struggle and we struggle to get it right because we hear already in our heads the perfection of it. And when something comes close to that, it gives us a satisfaction that is so cell deep mm -hmm. that all we want to do is go practice it some more. Mm -hmm. And the, the pure brain research doesn't really explain that drive. I mean, Daniel Coyle is uh, much better at it than a lot of other authors because he borrowed someone's phrase. I can't remember who called it this, but it's, he uses the phrase, the rage to master. And that, that, that desire to go out and master something, I think it's built so deeply into our DNA, I think that's why we manage to survive as little naked apes with no real physical skills compared to other animals. It's our rage to master that made us rule the world. You know, that's so true. I'm going to interview Alice Schroeder next hour, and yeah. she wrote the book, uh, the Warren Buffett book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the keys that I got from his journey was this rage to master. He really just loved numbers and businesses. And, I mean, he was his focus and clarity, it was 100% about that. I know. 
I so wish that I had that. And I have to tell you something. I've had insomnia my whole life. I've never fallen asleep when I didn't want to. I've just been up all night, and I'm, I forget things, but I'm raring to go. The only time I have ever fallen asleep involuntarily is when I visit my accountant and he starts talking about my money. I literally put my head down on the table and fall sound asleep, and there's not a thing I can do about it. I don't care about money. It drives me crazy. I'm like, I would play the piano six hours a day if I could, but I, you want me to pick up a paycheck? Oh, I you know, one of my my friends who's got a lot of money consciousness once called me laughing hysterically because I'd sent her a book that had, I was using as a bookmark, $200 bills. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's that lightness of attention as well. Mm-hmm. Because I, I think I'd have a lot more money if I were, you know, I talk to Susie Orman when we see each other and she's got the rage to master with money. And she starts talking and giving me all these hints, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and it's, it, I, sh- I want to want to, but I just can't pay attention. But um, I can't. I, what I can do is get really playful about imagining it, dropping it, and then going and having fun. And then people end up paying me for the t- things I do to have fun. <laughs> it's amazing. I think it's been working for you. <laughs> I, it, it, it's doing a lot better than I ever expected, that's for sure. But yeah, so back to the rage to master, I think that's so important because I know as a swimmer, you know, I would get up at four o'clock in the morning to be in a cold pool in California outside at five in the morning. I would not do that at (laughs) gunpoint. I would say, go ahead, pull the trigger. It would be so much better for me. And it wasn't, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy, because I'm a night owl. I'm not a morning person, but I did it because it served a purpose for me and I felt good. So what is it about some people that they have the rage to master and other people don't? Like I, I have two kids with the rage to master and one who doesn't have it. Right, and, and it's not the one with Down syndrome who doesn't have it. She's just really, really a happy gal kind of hanging out and um, like building websites for herself. But, she, but you know, try, try to give her a job doing it and she sort of forgets she has a job, which doesn't, she used to forget she was, she would do these brilliant high school assignments and then forget to hand them in because she was finished with them. So, so she didn't have any, she still doesn't have any particular rage to master, like, the system. And she's a wonderful person, but I'm like, as a mother, I'm like, how do you give someone the rage to master? So I have two, I have two hunches. Yes. And, and, and so one of them is that I know as an athletic coach, when I see kids that don't have the rage to master, they don't think that it's possible for them, that they could be really good. That's one. They haven't ignited enough. Yeah, they're not ignited enough. And then the other side, and my husband coaches at the university, he's a swim coach too, is when he does, he'll say this sometimes with um, one of our daughters. He'll be like, she's just really well balanced. There's no need for her to rage to master because she just feels really good about herself. Yeah, I have to get that through my head, my own (laughs) head, because she's just so, like, she's so happy just (laughs) hanging out. You you know, and when you look at, like, I mean, my experience is a lot with athletes, right? Yeah. And uh, my husband coached a woman in 2004, made the Olympic team, and she just said, oh, well, we're just on on the bell curve. We're on the other end. We're not very stable beings, and that's why we're willing to, you know, make the sacrifices that we are that are irrational, because we call it irrational excellence. Ooh, I love that. And so, you know, they, they are willing to make those sacrifices, whether it's financially, personally, whatever, because they, they're not balanced. Okay, this, this invariably brings to mind, you know we had to talk about this, Tiger Woods. Okay. Okay, there's a guy with the rage to master. You can see it. I mean, watching him win the U.S. Open on a broken leg was epic, mm-hmm. right? But do you think it goes with being unbalanced like that? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I think... I wonder if it's you have a lot of narcissists. This is what I think. There, it's, I said this in one of my books, Steering by Starlight. There's power and, and desire at the level, there are three levels of your life, and the outer one I call the shallows. And there you want material things and sex and drugs and rock and roll and that whole thing. And you work to get it and you manipulate and you do all this stuff. And then at the core of your being is something, I call it the core of peace, that has no thought and no emotion and is just pure being, which is blissful and calm beyond description. He's not as the world giveth, as 
the New Testament says. And if you go to that place, people just give you stuff and you win things and your businesses work and everything. It really, really works. So why people don't go from the shallows to the core of peace? Because on the shallows, you have almost no power. Mm -hmm. You just have physical power, money power, whatever you're fighting with. And in the core of peace, as you and I both know, you were just telling me how you basically walked up a wall Mm -hmm. by getting rid of the the shallows thought, well, there's a certain physics going on here, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is not possible. And as soon as you got really out of that and you believed it was possible, um, you went to your core of peace and suddenly were able to walk up a wall you couldn't walk up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the reason people don't go to the core of peace is that you have to burn up all your thinking and get rid of all your negativity to reach it. And once you're there, I think you have to be balanced. Don't you think so? And that's where the real power is. But very few people do it, I think. Yeah, I do think very few people do it. And I do think there's certain parts. I think there's certain parts of our life where we are at the core of peace. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it works. But then, you know, we're like an onion. And so yeah. there's other areas that aren't, we aren't necessarily at the core of peace. Yeah, that's true. There, like I, I'm completely in my core of peace when it comes to manifesting a Christmas wreath. Christmas trees. I mean, who cares? I truly do not care. And that's why it works. Mm-hmm. Cup of coffee, great. Don't care that much. It worked. And then other things that I've clenched with, you know, white knuckles my whole life still haven't happened. Well, not many. I, I wrote down a list the other day of things that seemed like they took forever, but the fact is they were crazy, wild, out-of-the-park dreams that actually came true. And I'm telling you, by the time I finished that list, I was on cloud nine. I'm like, wow, I uh, kind of have been blessed with everything I ever asked for. So I think I get to the point where I finally let go enough um, to give the universe space to act. And um, I've just got to learn to do it more more adeptly. And that's where we deep practice it, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. I have a rage to master this. And my question for you is, did you learn this at Harvard? Yes, but I learned it from my pre- uh, my um, unborn son with Down syndrome at Harvard. Uh-huh. I learned it by going to Harvard and then having Harvard knocked out of me, um, like being hit in the teeth with a baseball bat. I think very often, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the, the um, feminist, I think that's her name, sleep deprivation, um, she used to say, women have been systematically disappointed in the law, the polity, and the economy, and my task in life. And when I read this first, I thought it, she'd say is to, you know, write the balance, get justice, all that stuff. But she didn't say that. She said, my task is to deepen this disappointment in the hearts of women until they will suffer it no longer. So very often when we, we try to make something happen, what we get, or what we're meant to have, comes to us in the form of its exact opposite, which then deepens our disappointment until we will suffer it no longer. So I was was at Harvard, and unknowingly hating the fact that I was all, it was this ego fest where everybody's trying to be smart and happy and um, smart and really, really smart. And then realizing how miserable I was by having a child who was mentally retarded. And that deepened my disappointment so intensely that I decided not to be, not to be disappointed by that anymore or to buy into the unfairness of that at all or any, anymore. And at that point, um, everything started happening in a very magical way. And I think it's true for everybody. So whether you're like having a great time and you're on the brink or your your life is horrible, you're very, very close to the end. The good end, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very close to the end if I drive today. <laughs> you're but listening. you're very close to breaking through, you know, breaking through into that core of peace where you're going to be able to do anything. And, and when you're going through the breaking through point, can can there be a struggle in there? Oh, I think there's always humongous struggle. As the, as the shallows fight to remain in control, um, this is your physical, frightened little animal self, your inner lizard, as I call it, your reptile brain, 
and it its middle name is struggle baby all it wants to do is struggle it thinks that struggle is going to create all the good stuff and i see this all the time i do it all the time you know if somebody came to me and said you're bankrupt you have no money I would go into an inner lizard panic, and I'd think, oh, my God, I have to get more money, I have to get more money, and because that's what the brain does. Mm-hmm. And in the old days, I would have had to struggle terribly to get rid of that. I would have had to go through long periods of poverty where I learned that it was okay. Um, well, actually, I'm describing what did happen. <laughs> I would have had to, I would have really have to wrestle with fear, 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 depression, anger, all that stuff. And what would eventually happen was I would completely accept it, and then I would relax and realize that I'm fine. I would be fine living in a homeless shelter, and then I'd get plenty of money, just automatically. Isn't isn't believing that we have to struggle? Isn't that a thought? Of course it is. So if we don't believe the thought that we need to struggle and we don't engage in it, then it will we have a struggle? Let me give you an example from my wonderful genius son with Down syndrome. Okay. Um, we go to the same personal trainer, and we work out together sometimes, and he is strong like an ox. I mean, that kid, you know, he's supposed to have low blood, muscle tone. He could, don't mess with him in a dark alley. He will cave your face in. Um, so he's really strong. And he's on, he was doing chest press. He was lying on the weight bench, pushing the weight up, you know, bench press. And one day he was, like, really tired, and, and the, his trainer took the weight from him, and she said, uh, that looks a little hard for you. Are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm tired. She said, well, have you been getting enough sleep? He said, no, I stayed up really late last night singing. And um, she said, she took, said, well, I, you really need to get more sleep. And she, put, she turned around and put the weight back on the weight rest, and when she turned around, Adam was sound asleep on the weight bench. <laughs> You know, you want me to lift this? Okay. You want me to go to sleep? Okay. You know, he just does it. He doesn't fight with himself. He doesn't fight with his body, with reality. If he sees that something is good, he just goes there. No struggle. And so his life happens pretty well. I've noticed that he manages to manifest things all the time. Well, And he doesn't struggle with the idea that, oh, I'm a a child, or he's now an adult, I am an adult, and I have Down syndrome, and life shouldn't be this way. I don't know if it's his nature or if it's the fact that he has almost no language, um, because thoughts that elaborate can only exist if we can tell stories about them. Mm-hmm. If we don't have the story, we're just present. As Byron Katie says, you know, you, you work and you work and you succeed and you, you try harder and you do well or you do badly, and no matter what, you always just end up sitting in a chair somewhere. And Adam's always just sitting in the chair. So once, I remember when he was about 15, he told me he felt bad about having Down syndrome. And it just ripped my heart out. But he was over it. That, that's all he needed. And he's very, very, very wise. He's very much aware of who he is and his condition. And he had, I just get the feeling he's a little angel who chose that form for some reason. And he's good with it. And he's magical as hell. <laughs> You're listening to Crim Moticitis on How She Really Does It. And I'm talking with Martha Beck, author of Expecting Adam, Finding Your Own North Star, and Staring by Starlight, to name a few titles. So, Martha, before we go further in this interview, one of the listener questions has been, what is Adam doing now? He's so great. I mean, aside from personal training and learning martial arts, oh my gosh, he has a kick like a mule. Um, he's doing a sort of vocational program with his high school where he, he goes to work um, at, he, he goes to a nursing home and works there and he helps in a restaurant. He does a bunch of job related things. But um, it's so cool because I, I have this obsession with Africa and with rebuilding the wilderness of Africa and helping the people and creating, getting Africa out of poverty. I have little goals like that. And, um, He's, he's always, I always invite him to go with me. He's my last kid at home. And he always says, no, too many bugs, got to lie. One time when I asked him to go to New York to meet a movie star with me, he looked at me and said, hello, I have a life. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'd always say, you want to go to Africa? No. Sure, no, don't want to go. 
Well, he went to his training program at the beginning of this year, and without telling me, he informed his teachers that this will be his last year and he's, he's probably not going to be there much because he's going to be spending so much time in Africa. And I was, the teacher told me this, and I was like, hooray, hooray. And I, he just got invited to go to the national, um, he qualified for the National Olymp Special Olympics meet in swimming, your favorite thing. Yay. And um, I gave him a choice, the nationals or Africa. And he went for Africa. Yes! <laughs> so not that I have anything against sports, darling, but... <laughs> It's fun to have my kid with me. So he's, he's planning, God knows what, he's planning to save Africa for all I know. He is not very verbal. Uh, it's hard to understand anything he says, and he doesn't say much, but he has it going on. But he's also been your, your biggest teacher. Yeah. He's my little blonde Zen master for sure. They say when the student is ready, the, the teacher appears. He showed up. Well, he showed up and he dispelled the the Harvard myths, the what the rules mm -hmm. that Harvard and much of education will yep. tell us. Yeah, you know, you have to work really, 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 really hard and work really, really, really hard and lies, <laughs> lies, lies. You have to do deep play and fall asleep when you're tired. That's it. That is it. You don't even have to deliberately try any of the stuff we're talking about. You just do deep play and fall asleep when you're tired. Everything else follows. And I say that after not sleeping all night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do not do as I do. Do as I say. One of the things that I'm so infatuated with, and I, the key, I guess, cornerstone for this show has been: why are some people successful and why are some people not? You know, and um, in the swimming world, I feel like I've figured that out. You know, why? What? What? How do kids get in their own ways and mm. stuff? What do you see? With whether it's with clients or with people that you come into action, and, and you also get to work with, you know, you, very uh, successful people who really have a lot of limelight in the public. Yeah. But what are what are some key characteristics of why some people are able to create the life that they want? Well, it's all about self-imposed limitations, and the very first thing that I'm thinking, because I'm so used to thinking this way, when you say it, is that um, they d is it possible to not create the life that you want? Because I'm thinking about the core of peace. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to, to, to get the life you don't think you want. And a lot of the rich, famous, amazing, beautiful people that I've worked with are living in hell mm -hmm. um, because their thoughts and their emotions are all over the place. And money, fame, beauty, power. Actually, when you're on the, those levels, those high levels of the shallows, you actually suffer more because there's, there's just more intensity to it. Mm -hmm. So... The people who are successful are the people who are happy sitting in a chair somewhere. That's my new definition of success since I had my kid, right? And all the Harvard professors, they're sitting in their t in chairs in their offices. But they, I, I rarely saw one of them who looked happy. So what is success, first of all? Mm -hmm. but it, and, and it's basically, I think, we're sort of here to have the experience of being human. And that's it. We, I think at the end of life, we climb off the bus and go, woo -hoo, what a trip. How did you do? Oh, I suck. I blew out. You know, I got in a car wreck when I was only 12. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. You can go back next time. You know, I don't know what happens. But I don't think it's possible to fail. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's possible. It is possible to suffer. And suffering is always due to having a messed up set of beliefs that cause you to do things that aren't right for you. It's that simple. And you can find your way through those by, by locating beliefs that are at the heart of your pain, wherever it is, and then just questioning them until you see that no thought is actually substantially true. And then life su it succeeds you by itself. There's nothing left to do except play and sleep when you're tired. So, so in my college job, one of my four jobs, but in my college job, um, I, te I was teaching adults to s beginning swimming. And... Okay. Um, so the very the beginning of the semester in August, I, I met with the class and I said, look, this is, gonna, this is a very difficult class. This may be one of your hardest classes because of all the thoughts and beliefs that you have about water and the fears. And I said, I am inviting you to be willing to suck at this. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me and their mouths were hanging open. And I said, look, I'm going to meet you where you're at. You know, I, I ask you not to compare yourself to somebody else because you don't know. Maybe this is their second or third time taking this class. You don't know what their experience is. I'm working with each of you 
at where you're at. And if you continue to come, you will get better and you will, you know, you will feel more comfortable. You will get better in this, in this class. And so we just ended on Thursday and it was the most successful class I've ever had. We had so much fun, you know, and I really helped them take the judger. I call it the judger out of it and Uh and be like I created, I feel like as a teacher, a compassionate environment where, where they could learn to um, fail where they could suck. And it was okay. This, this doesn't mean that you're never going to learn how to swim. We just need to work on this. Well, I knew it. You, you were teaching brilliantly because they've shown that if you tell someone you're good at this, they tell children, give children a test and they tell half of them, boy, you did really well. you you really are smart. You're gifted. And then they told the other kids just randomly, you must have worked really hard. You didn't, You weren't perfect, but clearly you worked hard, and you could probably get better. Just exactly what you Mm -hmm. told these people. Don't worry about sucking. There's no suckage here. (laughs) Um, Just, uh, you know, work hard. You'll do better. Then they they put the kids through all these learning experiences, and the kids who were told that they were smart and that it just came to them by nature refused to try anything new, became totally fear-bound, and when they were retested, dropped their scores by like 30 points. They, They lost ability. The kids who were told that they worked hard and that they hadn't done perfectly, but what, what does that matter? It's all about the working, and you'll get better. Those kids were more adventurous. They chose subject matter over, way over their reading level, way over their knowledge level. They enjoyed the, the studying they did, and their, point, their scores on that first test were up 20 mm-hmm. points when they retested them. So that whole attitude of trying to do it right and thinking that you can or can't be gifted and you can or can't succeed, all those dichotomous thoughts hold us back. The only thing that is necessary is to ignite your imagination, be willing to suck, and have a blast. And that's exactly what we did, and it was the most successful class. That So one of the, one of the things that it's beginning swimming, so um, to have water safety, you know, I explained to them that, um, what I'm looking for at the end of the semester that they can swim continuous for five minutes. And I say, this doesn't affect your grade. This just no, gives you an, an input that if you're out on a lake and you fall off a boat, that you have a better chance if you're five minutes away to make it back to shore. Right. Right. And so that's like, so it's a, it's a duration and an endurance. And I said, and if you don't get that, that's okay. You just come back. And I said, really? the average student, you know, takes this class anywhere from two to four times, two to four semesters. So understand that. Right. And mm-hmm. so my highest number until yet this week was seven. And this is out of a class of like 30. Okay. Yesterday, I had 12 out of 27 pounds. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Huge. And I think a lot of it had to do with just this, all this life coach training that I've gone through and being able to set up an environment. Because I know how to teach people how to swim. Right. But set up this environment where they felt safe. Right. Where they could learn and then, you know, take the judger out of it. And we had a great time. We had fun. They yep. were clapping for each other. And, you know, there was a lot of encouragement and there was a lot of support. And we got rid of a lot of the comparisons that they may have done otherwise. And so I explained to them at the end of the class, I said, look, look at these skills. You really came up against yourself in something that was really fearful. A lot of you probably have a lot of thoughts and beliefs, and there's a lot of issues with water, right? And mm-hmm. some of you didn't want to put your face in the water at the beginning. And I said, now you now remember the success and how you did this for yourself mm-hmm. and take it and apply it in other areas of your life. Yep, you know? the way we do anything is the way we do everything. Yep. And I said, don't fondle the fact that, you know, you didn't sit here and go, well, you know, I almost drowned it too. We didn't focus on that. You know, we focus on, okay, let's take one stroke. Okay, let's do this. And I said, for those of you who didn't make the five minutes, you just, you swam two laps. That's huge from where you were in August. You right. Know, noticing the growth and using that. And that, that's the key. And that was, and I said, this is what you can do because in life things are going to come up and, you know, you're, there's going to be difficulties. And, but you know that you've accomplished because of what you've done here. Right. And that image in your head, it doesn't even, the verbal stuff, the story you're asking them to tell, and I think you should inform your listeners that we use the, the word fondling <laughs> to talk about the way we hang on to our negative beliefs. Mm-hmm. She didn't just use that word because she's a perv. She used <laughs> that word because I'm a perv. Um, <laughs> Not true. So, yeah, you were just, you gave them a story for their monkey minds to play with, and then their bodies took over and had fun. Mm -hmm. And that is a much deeper intelligence than anything I ever learned in a classroom or you ever learned in a classroom. Our whole culture is teaching us not to access our real power. Mm -hmm. It's just our brains. Okay, fine. They're okay. They do their job. But they're like, 
So the thinking mind is like a pair of scissors. It's great for certain tasks, but most of the tasks we do don't require that type of cerebral attention. They require the relaxed, you know, um, sort of try and fail body memory of action. And it's just the way we do anything is the way we do everything. So notice, I want everybody listening to go out and do some action today that you don't do well, but you love the thought of doing well. And then you'll feel what it's like to just play around with something and then watch what happens the rest of your day, especially if you can hold that energy. It's really, really interesting. And I think I got the compassionate observer from Susan Hyatt, you know, really being a compassionate observer instead of a judger. Mm -hmm. And what, what did we do wrong? Because I know with my clients, when I ask them that, they feel really defeated when they have their judger on. Right. You know, but when they look at it from a compassionate place of, okay, this is what I want to do. I haven't gotten there. And what can I do to get it where it is that I want to go? And, and, and then you're problem solving, but you're not beating yourself up. Mm -hmm. Although, again, you know, Getting, oh, oh, perseverating about the how yes. is one form of grasping. Yes. So if you feel, I mean, one thing to remember when you're, when you're trying to make your life work is pay attention to your muscles. If they're contracted and tight, you're not using your real um, power. You're in the shallows. If your muscles are loose and relaxed and you feel good, you're, you, you're in the actual power zone. Your body is always telling you whether you're aligned with that zone or not. And it opens and relaxes, even if you're in great effort, when you're on track. And it contracts, even when you think you're happy, when you're not doing it from the core of peace. And that's just, I cannot emphasize enough how powerfully your body can be your guide in this whole effort. Well, and that's why I like to do the work with you, because you're using your body compass. As yeah, because I had a chronic pain condition for 12, that kept me in bed for 12 years. And, um, you know, and you are on the far opposite extreme where you were a champion, a physical champion. Either one is going to make you pay attention to that physical signal. And, again, the way we're educated makes us not pay attention mm -hmm. to it, which is just crazy. Mm -hmm. And then, but it's so empowering when you realize it's your body and it's you that has the answers for your life. Yeah. It's just always, as I often say, my body is the only thing I never misplace. <laughs> Actually, I do misplace it, but I, I'm always pretty sure it's there close by. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, our listeners today, I just I want them to know and I hope that they can take away from this talk that it is possible, even in this economy with the recession and everything that's going on, to really create the life that they want. Oh, economy, shm economy. <laughs> I, I was in San Jose doing a seminar, and I was talking about how the press just decided one day to get really scary about the economy. And the same crazy economic stuff was happening the day before. And the San, the San Jose paper had this cover story of people living in a tent city. And the whole cover story was, oh, my God, these people, you know, they're bathing in the water from a little hose. And... It, you know, all over the country, all over the world, there are stories of people losing their houses and ending up homeless, and it just went just scare, fear, 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 fear. And then it says, story continued on page 16. You go back to this page 16, which is like buried in the tiny print, and then the story continues with, the reality, however, is somewhat less dramatic. <laughs> and the reality was that these people were like hippies who had been living in the tent city for years. People kept coming to bring them food and laundry and medical care, and they just didn't want to live in houses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a pure fabrication of fear. And I'm not saying there aren't real problems with the economy from a certain perspective, but from the perspective of the core of peace, those problems are totally insignificant, totally. And if you buy in to that scary story, you'll make it true for you. But if you don't buy in, you'll find your way through this amazing world with all these things that we could never do before. You'll find your way into something better than, what, than the best thing you can imagine. I mean, the sky's the limit these days. Have you seen the video, the, the perceptual blindness video with the, gor the gorilla and the basketballs? Yes, I love that. <laughs> I'm always trying to get it online, and they keep, like, protecting it and encrypting it, and I find a new way to find it. 
you better tell the listeners what that is. Yeah, so, and um, I think Jeanette Mon, I've talked about this before, but so if you didn't hear that interview, there's uh, six people, three with white shirts and three with black shirts, and they have a basketball, and the instructions are to watch and count how many times the white the people in the white shirts pass the basketball around. Yeah, and it's it's like close up. It's in a it's mm-hmm. in a hallway. So mm-hmm. these people, it's like just a bunch of people in a hall. And then so you and so the directions and the the TED talk actually has it so that he says that women are better at counting this than men. So he even sets up another mm. layer to it, right? And mm-hmm. then so everybody that Get I the show ego in there. Yeah, so everybody that I show it to, they're so into getting the answer right that that's all they see are these baskets and and, it, and there's two basketballs that are being passed around. So there's movement. Well, what happens is, and I'm going to ruin this for you all, but what happens is that there's a guy in a gorilla suit or a person in a gorilla suit that comes walking into the circle and walks out. And everybody that I've shown this to has never seen the gorilla. They don't see the gorilla. And this is a close-up. This is like all it shows is these six people, and the gorilla just walks in, does a little dance, and walks out again, and people don't see it. We don't see what's right in front of us. Mm Mm-hmm. It's so spooky. We don't believe what we see. We see what we believe. Yep. And that's what gives me, like, when we think about fear, again, mm-hmm. it's we're not seeing anything else. There's there's opportunities that are right in front of us, but we don't see it because we only see the fear. Yeah. What, most of my coaches and I, you know, we've, when people will come up and start talking about the terrifying economy, we, we get kind of confused for a second. And then we're like, oh, yeah, right. There's supposed to be an economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just doesn't wash. It's, once you've questioned all your thoughts, that, that one dissolves really quickly. And all I see is a vast technologically driven change that is, is making corporatism collapse, a social economic structure collapse, which I love reading about because I'm a sociologist. I read about it for fun. And um, incredible new ways of making a living just being developed by the bushel and if you're creative, you're open, and you're not stuck in the old mode of thinking, I've got to have a job, I have to sit in that cubicle for the rest of my life, then you can use, you'll have ideas for making your life work because the tools we have now are unprecedented. It's a great time to be in business. It's a great time to be fired because it's the golden <laughs> age of the, of the entrepreneur. <laughs> As I was with Brooke and a bunch of other people, we were like, we're the only group of people that are like, yay, you're quitting your job. <laughs> I know. This is fabulous. You got fired. Oh, you have no idea how many people I've coached who are thrilled to be fired. We got them all set up to do what they really wanted. And then it was like, more layoffs. Oh, I got my golden parachute. They gave me my retirement practice. Now I'm off to save the world, you know. And they always we create another plan, and I can't go into the specifics of each one because they're so infinite and so varied that you can actually shape your career to your own passions more than ever before. Well, Martha, thank you so much for helping me inspire the listeners to what is possible and to empower them that they can create their own lives. Oh, and thank you so much for keeping me awake for an hour. <laughs> I'll send you that perceptual blindness uh, video so that you have it. Oh, it's the best, isn't it? Everybody should watch it. No, show it to your friends because you, you, once you know, you're looking for it. Yes. But show it to your friends. You won't believe it. It's amazing. Well, thank you very much, Martha. Thank you, Corinne. It's great talking to you.